Welcome to Cynical Celluloid, the post-apocalyptic video store at the end of the world. This episode, we're digging through the radioactive dirt to uncover a deadly remnant of a devastating war in a world laid to waste. Life, death, and the sleaziest society imaginable. In Richard Stanley's Hardware. A scavenger on the hunt for scrap to sell uncovers the remains of a serious-looking robot buried in the highly radioactive wasteland. Returning to the poverty-ravaged city, he sells the remains to Moses Baxter, who gives them to his artist girlfriend. Fascinated by the curious artifact, she works on the dismembered robot, not realising that it's not as dead as it may seem. That's until it manages to rebuild itself, going on a murderous rampage and unleashing its lustful desire to kill. If there's one thing that Richard Stanley does well, it's world building. From the opening we're dropped into the middle of a radiation-soaked desert, less Mad Max and more Strontium Dog. And into this brutal landscape we join a lone wanderer, who finds the remains of an android. Mo and his friend Shades buy the robot parts and head to see Mo's girlfriend. This takes us for a few minutes of setting the scene for the populated part of the world, and it's quite the journey. There's squalor, violence, poverty, and a narrow path of survival even in what remains of the cities. Even those who have something, don't have much. A taxi driver played by Motorhead's Lemmy, and uh, yeah, there's quite a bit of that in this movie, laments the increase of violence from just being knuckle dusters and clubs to the uses of guns, in what is an amusingly British perspective, and the homeless populate the corridors and stairwells of their dilapidated apartment buildings. All of this, along with the dialogue about how poisonous the world is, paints a much wider picture than even the highly uncomfortable visuals give us. In one moment, a child is seen tethered to its mother, who is either unconscious or dead. And this is at the nice end of town. Of course, that's relative. Though Jill, Moe's girlfriend, has more than most of the unfortunates just outside her door, her apartment is a dystopian hellscape in its own right, Grimy neon colour saturates the place in contrast with the deep shadows. It's like a burned down Las Vegas that had a junkyard explode in it. It's a place of work, a home and a refuge where the only comfort is the industrial blast door that's the only way in. Well, except the vicarious way through the window. Now this is the thing. This world that we've spent so much time setting up is great, but we don't now spend much time in it outside of this introduction. Why is this? Well, this is all part of the big picture, and hardware is more of a microcosm story. Much like how George Romero is the zombie apocalypse as a way to examine and drive the characters, Stanley gives us this good reason for why their story is set over 50% in one small apartment. And this is vital considering the budget that he had. It was rather tight. Most estimates are around the £1 million mark, or about $1.5 million, I think, at the time. This is comparable to Zardoz, though I'm not entirely sure if that includes the effects of inflation. It's also significantly less than the $6.5 million budget of Terminator or the $11 million budget of Alien. So there's necessarily a very efficient use of the outside world footage before we get to the meat and potatoes of the story. Between Hardware and Dust Devil, it's clear that, again, like George Romero, his filmmaking is somewhat pragmatic. It changes due to the circumstances. In this case, largely the budget. Given what the main part of the film is, it's sometimes the case that the world building slows everything down uh, quite a bit, maybe even too much, be it Lemmy's musing on the upscaling of violence or Iggy Pop's wild radio rants. When it happens, everything stalls as we sort of rubber neck at the madness of this corrupted world. But it isn't unreasonable. It isn't padding. When you take the story as a whole, in fact, it's actually quite necessary for it all to make sense. Thematically, hardware comes down to three main things for me. Life, death and sex. Set against a nearly dead world as a barely surviving remnant of humanity and on top of that, reproduction is being suppressed by whatever passes as a government in this world. A call for the population to submit to sterilisation goes out, which is juxtaposed against a sex scene between Mo and Jill, where Jill herself describes having kids as being stupid, sadistic and suicidal, and Mo says that he's stopped thinking of having kids a long time ago. Her creation comes primarily in the form of her art. Sex in this world is as corrupted as any other aspect, from the implication that Shades has been keeping Jill company, while Moses has been away, 
And there's Mo's encouragement of that. And it goes through to the pervert who spies on Jill through her window. And of course the robot's own lustful overtones. Sex is presented through both normal human perspectives and highly corrupted ones. The cyborg itself is a mirror of the world's corruption. It's innate violence in a world that is quite enough of that already. The military origins of it and the sexual suggestion in its build and action build a picture of a world where sex, death and violence are inseparable. This is where hardware finds its footing in the face of an otherwise thin plot. Did I mention the robot's cock drill? No? Well, here it is. And it's the weapon that the Mark III uses to kill the wibbly-wobbly pervert after gouging out the guy's primary sexual organs. His eyes. Jill, the target of every phallus in the film, meat or metal, does get to emasculate the robot as she defends herself against its murderous and lustful advances. Set against a background of decay, Mo and Jill's reluctance to reproduce in the government's authoritarian anti-child policies, sex and life are the primary victims of this world that we're presented with. The robot is simply the automation of that attitude and boy does it ever absorb the worst aspects of it all. And this is the thing, the robot, it partly becomes Mo, complete with his shallow declarations of love where words sex should be. It consumes and assimilates the atmosphere of sleaze that Jill finds herself in. It does all this while combining it with all the violence it was designed for. Sex becomes an anti-human weapon in a world that was born of violence and desperation. And what else could it be? It just exists, persistently, and it can't reproduce other than through government-sanctioned programs. One of the most solidly sleazy antagonists would be the neighbour who spies on Jill. We just mentioned him a moment ago. Played with some astounding energy by William Hootkins, Lincoln Weinberg Jr. is a voyeuristic scumbag who spends his time perving over Jill as she lives her life. With sex being limited by legislation to a leisure activity at best, Lincoln is one extreme of what's left, and Mo the other. This is where we get to the most interesting character in the film. Shades, at least for me. Shades at a casual glance seems more like a side character than anything else, but his relationship with Jill is actually the most profound in the film. Where Mo sees Jill more like a fuck buddy, Shades clearly has far deeper feelings for Jill. Jill, for her part, seems to have some feelings for Shades as well, but for her, her feelings seem to be complicated by the more manly man who, no pun intended, comes and goes from her life. The guy who's less interested in a relationship than he is in having a good time whenever he's back in town. The less charitable take would be that Shades is the embodiment, possibly the lamenting of the nice guy syndrome, which brings up his own questions in relationship to the writing. Given the character's arc, from sidekick whose main duty is to mark Moe's territory until he gets back into town, to being the guy that saves the day. One wonders if Shades brushes up against the line of self-insert character. But there is a satisfaction in seeing the one guy who actually sees Jill as more than just a sex object get his chance to shine, even if it's with a comedic twist. Hi. Shades is the loser-does-good kind of character. After being essentially kicked to the curb by Jill, he resorts to drugs and meditation to hide from his obvious pain and frustration. But his escape from reality almost causes him to be incapable of going to help her. Amongst the characters, he seems to be one of the most developed in the film, alongside Jill. Which makes me feel that these two characters are the most important, even over Mo, who casually appears to be more active in the story. He seems more like a foil to Jill to me than a story driver. While the Jill slash Shades thread stops short of being a fully realised love story, it certainly feels more like a burgeoning one, and in this world where even a more prominent hero basically sees Jill only as little more than a comfort stop, it's quite a nice contrast. There is another underlying theme to the movie though, vision, eyes. From the neighbouring perv who has super-powered opticals available to the robot's enhanced vision, sight becomes a tool of evil in its own right, and even foreshadows the robot's eventual demise. 
denial aside, is how the evil is defeated on a couple of occasions with Lincoln upset at Jill, closing the blinds only for it to give the robot a place to hide before it gouges out the sleazeball voyeur's primary sexual organs. And of course, the robot's inability to be able to see through a shroud of cold when Jill hides in the fridge. The moment of Moe's hesitation when trying to destroy the robot also demonstrates the importance of the visual aspect. The robot seems to rely on its target's eyes to assess the situation. When Shades is in an identical situation later on with the robot, it can't see past the eyewear which gives the drug-impaired guy time to do what he needs to do. Also, the eye of the robot is linked directly to its own means of destruction in this wonderful cut. On that subject, the robot is flagged from early on as being vulnerable to moisture, not generally a problem in a world that's not seen rain in a long time, but given the threat that it presents to humans, I'm eagerly awaiting an army of mankind armed with super soakers. The world of hardware is very bleak and somewhat disturbing given the state it's in, but despite how small a story it has been set mostly in that apartment, Stanley does manage to craft a surprisingly large world around it, complete with a political landscape that is as hostile as the deserts from where the robot came. The Romero-esque reduction of that hostile world makes for a very lean piece of storytelling when a small cast of characters gives us a self-contained microcosm of a dying world, where there is at least some hope that certain characters may be able to pave the way forward for humanity's survival. This, this kind of storytelling is my favourite kind. It allows it to feel more relatable on a human scale rather than just on a societal one. On Stanley, auteur is a rather misunderstood description, seen by some as a prestigious title to be awarded exclusively to highly critically regarded film directors. It's in reality more an identification of a filmmaker's ability to make films, good or bad, that are unmistakably theirs. Kubrick, Lynch, Cronenberg, are kind of people in this genre that usually get this label attached to them, but equally it applies to Michael Bay. So when I say Richard Stanley is an auteur, it's not necessarily as an instant seal of approval, but certainly a nod to his unique aspects of his films. I just happen to think that he's a remarkable director as well. Hardware, like Richard Stanley's other films, is a highly stylized affair, drawing on a wide range of influences and inspirations. Most prominently, Alien, Terminator, some 2000 AD stories, possibly Max Headroom amongst others. And if that mashup seems chaotic, I tend to agree. Does it work though? Well, we'll explore that in a moment. From this, it may sound like hardware is something of a knockoff, to which I say, while Stanley does indulge himself in very prominent influences, it should be said up front that the results are greater than the parts that it's made with. This collage of familiar images are used to make a unique picture that carries its own story. Yeah, it looks like the Terminator, but it doesn't play like it. Though it's probably fair to say that sometimes the visual references can be a little overwhelming. Ironically, many of the inspirations have themselves been subject to claims of lifting, and the most prominent resulted in court action. While it's unreasonable to deny the resemblance between shock and hardware, it should be noted that the original story isn't exactly one with a huge degree of depth. Shock, like hardware, has a guy bringing his girlfriend the parts of a robot that reactivates in her apartment and goes after her. In broad strokes, it's exactly what hardware is. This is not to disparage the comic book version of the story, but shock is extremely thin as stories go, being much more of a spectacle than a fully fledged story. And while hardware isn't exactly an epic scale story either, it does add a solid dose of substance and ideas to the mix. Shock was just a one off comic book story, a quite striking one in that usual shockingly adult 2000 AD way but it skips through some action as fast as possible, and that's about it. Of course, it should go without saying credit should go where it belongs, and the writers, Steve McManus and Kevin O'Neill, eventually got a credit. All this said, hardware moulds all these familiar things into an incredible look and feel of its own. The music video sensibilities of Stanley in this, and in indeed 
uh, in Dust Devil are quite striking. Music is certainly very important to Richard Stanley, and the soundtrack, both the original and the licensed, are very much part of the identity of this film. Some of the key sequences are edited like a music video, not least the sex scene with the flowing cuts that almost jam with the band and the industrial mood of the music, which fits the twisted and decaying metal world we're in. Of particular interest in this respect is the hallucination sequence, which I described to my friend Josh as being something that Kubrick would have done if his career had gone in a very different way. And he told Richard Stanley this. It's a small world. And Richard, if you ever get to see this, thanks for the response. I'd love your work. What is funny to me about hardware is that it's a 1990s film that feels very much like an early to mid 80s one. The films I highlighted as possible influences, Terminator and Alien, are more so in an aesthetic way than anything else, but for me the most similar thing to it is Max Headroom. The look and feel of the world of hardware feels very close to Max Headroom, with the dingy, dirty, scrapyard world. The grainy CRT screens and their now retro-futuristic graphics, the cobbled-together tech, the grimy atmosphere and the claustrophobic interiors, Just take me back to that series, though, with a far more squirm-inducing level of seediness being present. That, on top of the similar, though more overtly adult level of commentary, does lend hardware a similar vibe to Max Headroom's nihilistic and dystopian vision. Though, as it may be obvious, I don't think many aspects of hardware are very original. I do have to say that it combines to be something quite extraordinary. Stanley's visual style is confident and consistent throughout the movie, and while I suspect there may have been a larger story and concept, I can't help but admire his ability to work with what he had, while concentrating a lot of thoughts into a small part of a much larger world that he built around the apartment. It's very impressive. And this is not in small part down to some amazing work by cinematographer Stephen Chivers who captures this super-saturated shadowy world without making the whole thing dark where it shouldn't be. And then there's the astounding editing by Derek Trigg who weaves the media types together and injects so much energy into this punk rock sci-fi. The cast is outstanding too with many of the -the off-the-wall turns for the peripheral characters really holding the screen through to John Lynch's eccentric yet sensitive performance as Shades then going on to the more grounded showings of Dylan McDermott as Mo and Stacey Travis as Jill. The latter is of particular note for me. She holds a perfect balance of being strong and vulnerable. She's frankly the most badass character in the film without it becoming in any way ridiculous. If you haven't seen Hardware, then seek it out and see a wonderfully 80s movie that was made in the 90s. While you're at it, if you're up for a double bill, then grab a copy of Dust Devil as well. Both films really capture that adult graphic novel atmosphere. And if you're into that kind of thing, then there are all too few peers for these movies. Certainly very few of this quality.